All right. Internal, okay. MTF, this guy's down at uh, 52%. Bad optics. No question, that's what we're trying to avoid today. Now, this wasn't due to standard LASIK. Don't misunderstand me. This was due to the non-recognition of dry eye before you did the LASIK. You don't ever want to do that. And what we do, I'll tell you a neat little test. It's kind of a neat trick. It's called a stair test. Terry O'Brien developed it at Johns Hopkins about five years ago, but it's real simple. If you take the smallest print a person can see, hold it right here, have them blink a couple of times and stare at it, that will blur on them in usually eight or more seconds. If it blurs uh, in shorter than eight seconds, that's abnormal and they have dry eye. It's basically the, the patient's point of view of a tear breakup time. But the patient's much better because you're trying to determine whether it's breaking up over the pupil and where it's going and they're looking at something and they'll tell you right then it blurs. And so that stare test, anybody that's over 10 seconds uh, or is shorter than 10 seconds in our practice, measured the second time and gets plugged, but they've got to be over a 10 second stare test before they can have LASIK to make sure it's lubricated enough after surgery. And then there's a pretty good study out there that's showing that you get a little better re, re with Restasis, uh, which is a product from Allergan. I have no financial interest, but it seems to help that uh, better than anything else. All right, last one we'll look at today, minus 12. Now, you don't do 12 Doppler LASIKs today very often. Uh, I do them rarely if you've got a thick cornea and everything's just right. But there's no question that the more treatment that you do on the surface of the cornea, the more aberrations you induce. And up around 10 diopters, most people would agree that you're moving up into a zone that you're going to induce aberrations that were not there before the surgery and the quality is beginning to be compromised. That's where my limit is, up around minus 10 or so. Some people draw that even sooner, around minus 8, but with wavefront guided, I do pretty good up around minus 10, but it's rare. All right, so let's look at this guy. Minus 12. All right, pretty good on topography. We got a pretty good zone here. Treatment's pretty good. Seems like a little hot spot down here, but we're on a quarter diopter scale, so I'm not too worried about quarter of a diopter of a little change in the cornea here, so we're on a real tight scale. Again, we look at the wave front, and what we see is that same little area that was there at the whole eye, OPD, is showing up right here on the higher order and on the whole map, so we know that's topographic, basically. And that's what I'm saying. When you see something like that, if you were going to go back to do a retreatment on that patient, it'd be much better to do a topographic guided, which DIDEC has because it's international, but it's not in the United States. So you couldn't do that, but what they call their CATs, uh, computer topography or computer uh, anatomy topography, actually does a good job. It does better than those. So when the problem's on the cornea, it's better to do a topographic guided. And if the problem's in the lens or the whole eye, well, then it's okay to do a wavefront guided. Again, got some little lenticular changes, but what we see again is this guy's got bad optics compared to what the virgin eye would have to the green patient. He's performing at 40% of the performance of a normal eye. All right, that gives us just about everything we need to look at here. So questions? Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me back up here and show you what, uh, well, the only two lines that you care about, well, the D line is a diffraction limit. I'm trying to get them to take that off of there. Well, no, there's a D line, which is diffraction. The B line, which is the green line, is the normal. And then we've got ratios to B, which is all the count. We don't, I put these on there initially to show what the diffraction was. But look at that, 11% because you're the diffraction. What we care about is A to B, 33%, and H to B, which is 32%, which is what the performance is to a perfect eye. The H is the higher order, and in this guy, all of his aberrations are higher order. Average for all aberrations. All is, A is for all, H is for high. B is for best, and D is for diffraction. I don't know how that translates in Japanese, but that's what it is. <laughs> yes, sir. You want to start comparing quality and results objectively Yes.
for the quality, disregarding the refractive error, the best one is the H to B, area under the curve. The, point, the Strel ratio is not bad, but it's going to come up with a number that's never over 0.4 because you're, it's not, Strel ratio is just like we do in those camera lenses, 100%. Well, the best that I have is going to be is 40 anyway, so you're starting off with a bar that's so low that it's hard to tell what's good, you see? Whereas if you start off with what we've talked about on the best MTF, well, then you're getting a value that's relative to the best human, not to the best camera lens. Well, now, that's a good question. Now, here's what happens. In Zernike's, which is what we're talking about here, now, remember, we don't have to go through Zernike's to get these higher order maps. Now, we generate Zernike's for you to select aspheric lenses, but we don't go through Zernike's to calculate all this stuff because we got it in refraction in the first place. But if you're going to look at Zernike's, then the higher the order, the better the resolution. So you put it as high as you can, which is eighth order, all right? The second thing is the size of the aperture is it, it's something that uh, there's a click in there that you can put in the Siles, you can't put in the Siles Crawford effect. So what's going to happen is when you select the six millimeter aperture, the performance you're going to get for the eye is much worse than it's really going to be in real life because the patient doesn't weigh those peripheral rays the same amount as an optical system. In other words, there's a Stiles Crawford effect. Four and a half millimeter pupil is the one that comes closest to uh, performing the eye the way it's actually working. The problem with that is, if the person has peripheral aberration and seeing halos at night, the bigger the aperture, the point spread function will show you the best of what that looks like to them. You see what I mean? So what happens is, if I've got aberrations from a small optical zone, I got a big pupil. Well, I go out in the light and I see fine. And I come in in the dark and my pupil gets big. If you select a four millimeter aperture, it's not gonna show up. But if you select a six, as big as it goes, then that'll show up as a reduction in the performance and in the point spread function will show you what the patient sees at night. So the MTF says it's down, but the point spread function shows you what they see when they look at a headlight. Six, because the question was, when you're trying to figure out the spherical aberration in the cornea to select an aspheric IOL, all right, the lenses have been labeled over a six millimeter zone because that's what we did in that original article. So in order to compare apples to apples, you got to select the same zone over the topography that was done originally in that original article. The Alcon lens, the uh, WF, is minus 0.15, the technus is minus 0.27, and the B and L is zero. And those are over six millimeter zones. So even if the patient has a four and a half millimeter pupil, you still have to talk about the six millimeter zone in order to compare, because if you cut it down to, say the patient only has a four millimeter pupil, well then the spherical aberration of the lens is not minus 0.27 for the technus over that, it goes down by the fourth order. Well, that means that instead of 0.27, it's about minus 0.05. So you can't do that. So it's better to do six millimeter with everything and if then you don't, then what you know is you're gonna end, you can't do it basically if you can't get a six millimeter zone. Would you count 12, 24, and 40 No, no. Those, that's not, no. And I know Doug Cote wrote an article on that and he's wrong. See, spherical aberration is an increase in power as you move out to the periphery. All right. That's the fourth order term, all right? It's a parabola. The next term up, the sixth order term, does this. It goes above that and goes below that, all right? That's the sixth order Zernike. It's got another little, it's got another little change in it. Well, you can't correct that with asphericity. You gotta put another little thing like that on the IOL. So that little double hip that you get up there, you can't do that with the lens unless you put that on the interocular lens and you're not gonna do that. So when you add that term in, it gets higher, but the interocular lens can't correct that in the first place. The eighth order term does this. There's two blips in that thing. So spherical aberration is this, second order or the sixth order is like this, and the eighth order is like this. So you're not gonna put that out on the edge of the interocular lens, so why would you wanna add that to the RMS error to get a bigger number when it's not gonna be corrected by the interocular lens anyway? It's not gonna help because it can't do that unless you 